it was this very, um, you know, hopeful <laughs> message. And the whole time I'm just like, yeah. You know, like, right, right. Ah. Um, how much do I pay you? Like, how does this work? Right, you know? right. <laughs> and I was so excited, right. and it was freaking magical. You know, I'll never forget. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Third edition is out now everywhere. Hardcover ebook, audiobook, however you like to consume books, you can find that book wherever you find the books. Today, my guest is Dana Nielsen. He is a, 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 an engineer, a producer, a mixing engineer, uh, artist, songwriter. He's most well known as an engineer and mixing engineer. He uh, he mixed a few tracks on SZA's uh, Grammy winning album SOS. Um, number one charting album, SOS, a few songs on that. He has worked with, uh, he's either engineered or uh, mixed or been part of Linkin Park, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Rihanna, Nicki Minaj, Madison Ryan Ward, the Avid Brothers, Metallica, Weezer, Post Malone, uh, Adele, I, I mean, the list goes on, Damien Rice, Justin Timberlake, it's, it's on and on, Black Sabbath, um, so uh, Bob Dylan, I, I can't skip over Bob Dylan. Um, we, we spent, so for those of you who are the, the gearheads, the, the technical ones of, of the bunch, uh, this episode is for you. Uh, we spent a lot of time kind of talking about, um, you know, kind of how he got into these rooms, how he got his start moving to LA and then ended up in rooms with Rick Rubin. Uh, Rick Rubin was, a, a has been a big collaborator with Rick Rubin who has kind of brought him into a lot of these sessions and how he, he got a lot of these, um, a lot of these gigs and then turned into these, these roles and these jobs and kind of growing from editor to engineer, to second engineer, lead engineer, mixing engineer, all of that. And what those roles are, how much they pay. If you're, if you're curious about the, about the business around this, because, uh, guess what? This is the new music business podcast. <laughs> Uh, we do stick around till the end and we we do dig into the business of all of us, how much each of these roles pay. We talk about points. We talk about, you know, uh, back end royalties, front end, all of that stuff. So um, stick around. And, and Dana has a very um, um, interesting story and fascinating uh, trajectory of, of all of this. So uh, for those of you that are that are uh, the studio heads and want to kind of learn how this major label story. Uh, recording studio system works. Uh, Dana's done it all, and and he steps you through it. And uh, he also does the indie realm. You know, he he does his own music. He helps indie artists. Um, I do want to plug. He's got a um, a community called Mix Protege and some courses there, so you can go check it out at mixprotege.com. You can also find Dana Nielsen at danaNielsen.com. He is also one of our star students as part of Ari's Take Academy uh, for the stu- Ari's Take Academy students that are listening. You know Dana because he's in our community group helping people out. And uh, honestly, Dana is one of the the warmest people. Um, and he's so generous with his knowledge and his wisdom. And he's always going above and beyond uh, just supporting the community at large. He's been supporting our Ari's Take Academy community. It's been a, a, a real privilege and honor to have him uh, as part of our community and academy and to, to chat with him today on this. So I think you're, you're really going to enjoy this one. Um, you can find uh, all of us at Ari's Take on Instagram, TikTok, X, Threads. Um, you can find me at Ari Herstan on Instagram. Visit Ari's Take.com. Get on that email list. That's where you can get the most up-to-date, relevant information about the new music business. Uh, but right now, if you could just, just pause this real quick, give us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, however you're listening to this right now, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Hit that subscribe, hit that follow button so you can uh, keep getting these episodes in your feed. All right, let's kick into the show. Dana Nielsen, welcome to the show. Ari, it is a freaking <laughs> dream to be here, sir. You are a legend. Oh, man. Oh, gosh. This is, uh, I, I, I gotta, I gotta thank you. And, and, um, the, the admiration is reciprocated, uh, 100%. Um, 
And but I do I, I need to start off by just giving a little insight uh, to the people uh, that that didn't experience the last 10 minutes of what we just experienced. <laughs> um, the, the, the pros and cons of of uh, being a a Grammy nominated world class mixing and engineering master uh, is that you have very expensive gear <laughs> and lots of it yeah. um the downside of it is that to do something as simple as just talk through the computer uh takes a lot of finagling through your <laughs> systems it seems it does <laughs> so just just to hear your voice now now you look amazing Thanks. you sound fantastic Thanks. um so your gear is is top notch clearly <laughs> and that board behind you is just stunning Boy, and i want to get to all of it yeah yeah <laughs> um but but anyway yeah it's um, quite not a, to get it yeah quite an ordeal over <laughs> Go ahead. here <laughs> so are you at home i am yeah this is my uh, wow. home studio yeah i mean this is quite a home studio well first off tell me about this board that you you got rocking behind you because you don't have too many people that have home studios with uh you know more than eight channels and and i'm looking at how many am i counting there's there? 24 30, 24 okay yeah and, and what uh, kind of board is that it's a uh Digidesign, with the precursor to Avid, uh, Digidesign uh, D Command, oh. which is part of their Icon okay. series of controllers. There's no audio. There is a little audio if you want to use the, the monitoring section, which I don't. Um, mm -hmm. But it is a very a lot of people these days know about like the S6 or the S3 or some of these newer um, Avid controllers and this is the iteration generation before that which was the icon series <clears throat> and mm. uh i guess i've always been with that gear i've always loved faders <laughs> like i have a uh -huh. say i sign off all my emails uh faders forever this is kind of a, uh, <laughs> okay. a a slogan of mine um because I am in the box as a mixer and have been for many years, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and which offers incredible flexibility and speed and all that stuff. But man, without tactile, what do you mix in Pro Tools? Yeah, in Pro Tools. Um, yeah, without that tactile control that connects me physically to the faders and and allows me to like put different fingers on and feel, you know, oh man, it's like I think back to the days when I used to do all this with a mouse or trackball in yeah. my case, um, uh -huh. and definitely uh -huh. like have mixed number one albums with a trackball, <laughs> but it's not Oh, wow. Fun, okay, sure, yeah. You know, it's Right, not, right, right, um, yeah. It really feels special and different and more in tune and connected with Vader. So, um, I but I've always, because like the S6, I think even like a, um, for anybody who's listening and doesn't know what that is, it's like the, top of the line avid controller it's a network device and it's got you know even if you get like that eight fader version it's going to be like 30 grand or, or more you know mm, wow um, and each and of it's these, just a controller it's just a controller and avid the company that makes pro tools so yeah. this is like i'm imagining a, pro, a, a controller just for pro tools yeah and these um fancier flagship controllers are kind of the, some studios will buy them uh but more kind of like post-production a lot of like film broadcast mixing you go to like a sound stage at you know fox or warner brothers or whatever yeah. um the networking capability and remote control and satellite systems it allows for these in insane configurations for you know the uh that the, makes the, sense um you know effects stage and the dialogue and the music and you know all these different mm. places to anyway it's going a little nerd mm -hmm. nerd talk but what I no, tend no, to, that's fine. Yeah. You know, what I tend <laughs> you, to do is like as right. a music um engineer and producer, like I need the faders. I want the the top of the line stuff that's like yesterday's used car, you know? <laughs> so when <laughs> what year did this come out? Oh gosh. I it predates Avid. Yeah. Um this was this came out when I was uh, my, my, this will be a fun segue, you know, when I, my wife and I moved to LA in 2000 and uh. my first job out of college was, uh, selling this type of equipment, uh, oh, at guitar wow. center in Hollywood, um, 
sunset. Right. Um, yep. And I, I'm a I'm a terrible salesperson, but I love the gear and I love like because <laughs> you buy all the gear yourself. <laughs> yeah, I just you know, I, yeah. you know, even when I didn't or don't have money for the things that I want, like I love what it does, and I I I do love uh, teaching other people, you know, what hearing what their needs are and and helping them find the right right stuff. So I, I remember mm-hmm. this came out around the early 2000s. Before that, it was the Pro Control, yeah. and that's what I had. When this came out, and it was the base model, thirty grand, you know, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. controller. Uh, I bought the 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 used car <laughs> of that time, which yeah. would have been the Pro Control, which was awesome. And I had that Pro Control for yeah. a long, uh, long time. And then when that finally, uh, it didn't break, but they ultimately um, not only stopped supporting it, but it uh, no longer would work with like the new version of Pro Tools and. At that point, mm-hmm. the S6 was out, but it was like, I can't make that leap. That's crazy. Um, mm-hmm. So I got this one, and uh, it's awesome. I'll, I'll do, I'll do whatever, whatever it takes to have uh, faders. And this is awesome because it's 24 faders, and I have dedicated <clears throat> knobs for inputs and record enable, solo, mute, panning, sends. Um, and I can, uh, at the click of a button, you know, I can create these custom you know you take a session that's got you know 100 plus tracks in it and all these Mm -hmm. subgroups and fancy routing and um i can navigate around a huge session really quickly and efficiently um and so it becomes even more a navigation and administrative tool for (laughs) managing large sessions as it does as much uh, fader control and and the actual fun stuff you know oh nice so that makes sense yeah so you have a home studio, but you also have a family, I do. and you have, um, you know, uh, how, what, what do you do at your home studio? Do you do much tracking? Is it mostly uh, mixing? Are you doing uh, full sessions? Do you have a live room? Like, uh, w- yeah, tell me about this this situation you got. Yeah, going right here. I've always had a home studio, um, even you know, in college, a little uh, corner of the bedroom. Uh, and then uh, through all of our different houses and apartments in LA, <clears throat> always some mm-hmm. kind of studio. And I've always done my mixing from home. Um, even mm-hmm. the, you know, earliest, you know, fanciest, you know, big artist stuff has always been from yeah. at sometimes. You know, my first mixes were in like a five by, or not five, could it have been, you know, six by six, you know, tiny little carpeted bedroom with little speakers and a trackball, mm. you know? Um, yeah. And um, it's for, you know, my own writing and producing and then mm-hmm. um, ultimately mixing. Uh, there isn't a, I've never had a dedicated live room. It always is um, the same spot and I, I could probably even like let me see if this is hooked up and eh, you see a little bit of it oh wow um cool for people just listening he switched his camera view that's pretty nifty yeah that's um, a cool contraption yeah so it's like there's oh yeah it looks great there's a bunch of um it's a big room um yeah and it's like a 20 by 20 room um <clears throat> And so, there's so do you bring of, clients in to yeah. li- listen to mixing process? Right, I see the couch there and everything. Yeah, yeah that's nice. I would say, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to break it down, like I all of my tracking I tend to do elsewhere. If it's like a full band, drums, I never do drums sure. here and stuff. But I definitely sure. do a lot of, um, you know, pre-production, definitely a lot of writing, uh, mm-hmm. singer-songwriter stuff. If it's somebody, you know, acoustic guitar and vocal, I do a lot of that that mm-hmm. type of stuff here. A lot of overdubs, a lot of vocals, even though there isn't a vocal ISO, uh, except mm-hmm. for like, you can kind of see behind me here, my um, little uh, makeshift uh, booth. It doesn't close off, but... Um, <clears throat> yeah, is that, a, I see that, yeah, yeah. But it's, a, it's a enough... A stopper in front of the mic. Yeah, it's, um, mm-hmm. it does, uh, it does the trick. It's not ideal. I love to be somewhere else where I can be in a controlled listening environment, not on headphones for vocals mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But uh, do I definitely is this re- do a ton of vocals here? 
Is this where you mixed uh, SOS, SZA's record, or, or mm-hmm. the few songs that you did on, on SZA's record? Yeah, yeah. I literally mix oh, wow. okay. everything I've ever mixed. Uh, yeah. Right well, house. that's right, because, so you moved, is this the first place you moved when you moved to LA in 2000? Have you been living here for 24 years? No, we have been living here for 24 years, but not in this house. Um, we, okay. we had a couple of apartments in Glendale, and then a house in Glendale. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also had a, mm. a, that was the one time I had a studio away from home uh, with my buddy McKay Garner, shout out to him, mm. amazing engineer. Um, <clears throat> and so I shared a little spot in his studio for a while. And then we moved to the West side, um, Santa Monica, which is where I had the tiny, um, you know, tiny, we had a tiny beach house type of thing, you know, um, uh-huh. s- several bo- blocks from the beach, but you get the idea that it was like a very small home. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, pre, pre-kid. Um, okay. And then when we knew that we were going to outgrow that family, uh, family, that house, and wanted to start a family, um, we moved to this mm-hmm. house in uh, Culver West, as a or Mar Vista. It's kind of a little overlap sure. area. <clears throat> and uh, cool. a lot more space. And um, it's just been... Uh, awesome. We love it here. And this room in particular has been great. It's uh, all kitted out acoustically. Um, And Carissa, my wife, who is a session singer, vocal contractor, um, music therapist, uh, she now has her own studio, uh, Studio C for Carissa. (laughs) Hers is built in the backyard, which I can see out through the the windows here. Oh wow! So, oh, that's awesome. Have you ever, uh, have you ever wired from there to there, uh, from the back house to your it, uh, your room here and, set and tracked up. live? We have okay. um, Dante run underground to that comes in to here. Um, What's Dante so, run? Oh, Dante is uh, that's like the um, uh, Ethernet audio protocol. Oh, um, cool. You can do like a zillion channels, uh, over ethernet, like one, one cool. cable. Um, nice. and, uh, it's used more and more in studios, uh, definitely in live and, um, stuff mm-hmm. like that. It's, it's pretty wild. So, um, when we cool. were running, you know, internet cables and stuff out there, I was like, Ooh, let's, let's toss a couple, you know, Dante lines in there, which basically just means some extra like cat six cables. Um, and cool. so we're set up for that, so- but haven't done it yet. Nice. So how'd you get your start? Um, you know, your your credits list by this point is unfathomable. <laughs> You've worked with every legend from uh, Bob Dylan to SZA and Rick Rubin um, and Chili Peppers and Metallica and, and uh, on and on and on, Neil Diamond. Um, but everybody starts somewhere mm-hmm. and uh, a, a kid from Chicago, how does he get to go on to uh, create all these incredible records? And um, yeah, just give me a little bit of your, your journey and just kind of how, how this all came to be. Yeah. Well, it all from Chicago. I mean, what got my foot in the door is I bring, a, oh, dear. I bring a Giordano's <laughs> <bears>. pizza to every <laughs> studio in town. I say, I trade you a slice oh, for a, <laughs> internship <laughs> a slice a deep dish <clears throat> yeah um <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah and we we uh carissa and i both grew up in uh chicago suburbs um and then went to school in new orleans at uh, loyola we moved here oh, nice right after college and uh yeah like i say i had my home studio and was just kind of uh i, I would run an ad every every month in music connection and uh oh my god and i would get like cool you know, independent clients, you know, some like working at the, uh, the sunset guitar center by day and, and doing, uh, Mm -hmm. producing and writing, uh, artists out of our, our house and apartment, uh, by night. And, um, eventually, um, through a series of, of jobs through, first it was guitar center, outside sales was like this, uh, what's not now, uh, formalized as guitar center pro, but, uh, back then was, uh, the upstairs, like off, <laughs> off the floor, uh, area of the Hollywood guitar center. Um, mm-hmm. and this woman, uh, Susan Wheeler there, w- she had all these amazing clients, um, 
that are people who wouldn't necessarily come into the the store and poke around sure. in the cacophony that that is a guitar center. And because <laughs> I was very lucky timing wise to have been in the I was a, a jazz major um, at Loyola who fell in love with the recording studio there. What was your instrument? Saxophone. Nice. Uh, and uh, I, the studio at Loyola happened to have recently at that time had upgraded to what was like, unbeknownst to me, the state of the art 24 bit 888s. You know, if you're a Pro Tools head, you'd, you'd be like, oh man, that's, I remember that gear. Um, it was like, <laughs> really, uh, really baller for the time. Um, and, and it's just what I, what I cut my teeth on and I, I did a ton of my own projects in there. I was the TA. Um, I had a set of keys. I was, I would stay in there all literally all night. And, uh, you know, I remember many times my, uh, the, the music, the director of the uh, music program, his office was right outside the studio. And he'd see me in the morning and be like, you been here all night again, Dana? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I ha I went, we moved to LA and I, I had, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, how special it was at that time to know, for a young, employable, uh, you know, nobody like me to have this like, Pro Tools experience. I was also at that time already like a beta tester for Digidesign. And oh, wow. so uh, Susan at the Guitar Center, she was like, you should come up and work with, with me and my clients. Um, and because um, again, I was like the, the not, not star salesman, but very knowledgeable, helpful person, you know, and, uh, sure. so she would do the selling to these incredible clients, uh, like, and then she'd send me to go set them up and train them at, like, I went to David Foster's compound several times and I'd go to like, you know, ocean way and, and drop things off. Or, um, I remember that was actually the first time I ever went to, um, the Houdini mansion, uh, <laughs> Rick Rubin's, hmm. uh, fame studio in Laurel Canyon, um, for the first time. Wow. Years, probably years before I met and, and started working with Rick. But um, I met a lot of people that way. Um, and when I left Guitar Center and later started doing the same type of job a couple of years later, um, freelance this time for Westlake, um, also in Hollywood, which is extra fun and cool because that's a, a like historic recording studio. Mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of incredible records were made and continue to be made. So, um, you know, maybe it was 2002 or something like that. Um, I was doing a similar type of thing for their sales department while mingling mm -hmm. in the studio department. And the short of it is like, same type of thing. They would sell to these unreal, you know, I'd go to Diane Warren's place and, um, you know, that's how I met, um, um, Colin Hay um, from Men at Work, who I, I had a long uh, history with, uh, both professionally and, and as a, a dear friend. Um, John Hanlon, nice. um, who's uh, Neil Young's longtime co-producer. Um, so if you look at my discography and you can see like all these years later, like, oh, these are some of the same um, folks. And uh, mm. to make a long story <laughs> slightly shorter, that's kind of how it started to happen. You know, I would help these incredible producers and engineers who at the time Pro Tools was like brand new to folks who were um, working on tape or Sony digital machines or, sure. um, and so it was this new thing. And that's what I mean about the timing. It just happened to work out that I, I mm. knew this stuff. Um, and yep. to Guitar Center's credit, they sent me up to Palo Alto for a week or two and like they I would get like special training from from reps like I was their their oh, wow, product cool. specialist you know so yeah. um eventually like I just had all these incredible clients and um I'll tell you a story this is this is this is important in my development that I think a lot of people would um appreciate is uh one of these sure. folks I was um tasked by one of these companies on a sales call to support a sale, go to like, uh, I think it was Fox or Fox or Warner Brothers mm -hmm. on the lot. And I brought this like, you know, I'm drooling over these boxes that I'm bringing into this guy. I don't even know. I, I can't remember who this person was, but he's an important part in my history where I brought in this, yeah. you know, $50,000 Pro Tools rig. 
into this little hmm. bungalow on the lot. And I'm like, wow, this is insane. Look at this place. And like, I have chills thinking about it. Like, who is this guy who gets to play with this gear that I love in this awesome little studio bungalow in between these sound stages? And and so we're chit-chatting and I'm putting it all together physically and inserting cards and installing software and just kind of, you know, uh-huh. shooting the breeze. And 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 when we wrapped up, you know, we kind of had this rapport and he's like, um, so what is, Dana, what is it you want to do, you know? And I was like, aghast. I, I didn't, I couldn't understand that he didn't read on my face. Like that. I was like, I want to, I want to do what you're doing. I want to use this, this equipment and like have a job, you know, like work in music and be a, and he was like, really? You know, he hmm. had no idea. And he said, you know, man, you got to tell people what it is you want, you know? And I was mm. like, man, I thought that it was, I thought you could just read it on me. Like it was, <laughs> oozing out of me, you know, and th- that right. was a really important lesson. He's like, yeah, man, just let people know like what you, what you want. And that really helped, has helped me get, um, like all, all the gigs. <laughs> um, wow. there's so many stories in my, um, in my career path that are based on that guy's advice, you know, where you see an opportunity and, uh, maybe you're overhearing, um, you know, give you another example where overhearing like, um, uh, I was working with Dave Schiffman on, um, system of a down. And at this point I've, mm-hmm. I've been, um, second engineering, assistant engineering, uh, stuff at Rick Rubin's, mm-hmm. um, studio, um, at, at his home. Mm-hmm. And I could hear Dave trying to, uh, I think he was talking to, Andrew Sheps, um, and he, he, who I, I hadn't met at that point and, um, needed Mm -hmm. somebody to edit these vocals and, and drums and stuff on this, um, project. And he wasn't, I could tell by this conversation I'm overhearing that, that Andrew wasn't available. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I said, and Andrew Sheps was the uh, the producer of the record. No, Rick was producing. On, or he was the mix. Rick was producing. He was the mixing engineer. Uh, Dave or? Shipman was the engineer um, on the hip- oh, okay. hypnotize and mesmerize albums. Um, Got it. And I was assisting Dave. And um, but I saw this opportunity, you know, and very, you know, uh, humbly, gently. <laughs> uh, it's always this fine line between, you know, being persistent and being annoying, you know, uh, but like, Hey man, sure. like, I would love an opportunity to do what it is you need. I've done that work in, in the past. I know how to, you know, edit vocals uh, and stuff like that. Um, you know, and he's like, mm, I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, right. And through a process of like, you know, flying this idea around and, um, that was a really big break for me. Uh, and, and Andrew, I don't know mm-hmm. if you know these names, but these two, um, these are both legendary, amazing, uh, engineers who, uh, were mm-hmm. both mentors, um, to me and from whom I learned a ton. And Andrew came down and, you know, he's like, I can't do this gig, but I'll, I'll show you, um, you know, he showed me Melodyne that, that day. And I, I hadn't mm. used that before. And, uh, and then I ended up doing, doing that on those, on those, as a double album. And, used uh melodyne system of a down used melodyne let it be known it be ladies kn- and gentlemen um, you know at the time <laughs> no, it wasn't everyone was using melodyne at the time yeah, right but this also, is what 2008 9 uh hmm later or i feel like earlier uh earlier. maybe eight seven seven or eight yeah. uh, i don't know okay. um I, I got a I got a plaque in my closet i could go look at um <laughs> but it it was at that point, you know, it wasn't a plug-in, uh, and it was a mm-hmm. lot of, um, and what I still do, do to this day with Melodyne is as much timing as tuning, you know, there's like oh, yeah, a sure. lot of stacks of things and massaging them together and maintaining mm-hmm. what's amazing about an artist's delivery and the, the delivery mm-hmm. that makes them unique, um, preserving that and just knowing how much to massage where needed to make it jive with uh, somebody else who overdubbed on top of it or whatever. Um, so yeah, sure, that makes sense. It's a tool, and it's it's not as much of a dirty word as uh, like auto tune or or what it used to be. But 
Uh, Melodyne is is something I think uh, everyone is very friendly with um, yeah. in the studio and and uh, can be so so powerful. And like you said, if the if the take is perfect and the delivery and the performance is uh, is magic, but they're just like just slightly off pitch, like not quite there, yeah. nailing it. It's just like why. Why try to get that perfect magical take again uh, only for the pitch when we have this incredible tool yeah. that can just like ever so slightly massage it to where where it can be. So yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot it's of sense. It's incredible. Yeah. It really is a, an amazing, yeah. amazing tool. It, you know, you were, you were in the room and it's really like you got that opportunity. Um, you know, they say luck is merely when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. And so, you know, you had been prepared you knew you could do it and uh the opportunity presented itself but you also raised your hand you yeah. you you put yourself out there and that that's like I, I think a really good takeaway uh like you said from your friend uh from the from the lot yeah the um, unknown which, unnamed guy who, the unknown who, right do we still not know who no. this guy is <laughs> no but <laughs> okay i was gonna say like I, I was waiting for it to turn out and it was rick rubin no, who, oh, okay, no it wasn't okay i'm still waiting for like who, no, who was that guy he's no, okay. like the mystery yeah. man in my you know career past wow. to who i'm thankful for but it's so true and and la especially which is a town of hustlers and a yeah. town of freelancers and it's kind of everyone is on short-term contracts. Everyone mm -hmm. is jumping from job to job in the entertainment industry. Yeah. You know, even if you feel like you're in something as secure as like television, which is not secure at all. Yeah. Um, it's because everyone's doing short term. You you work on a, a TV show and then the show ends and yeah. now you got to find something else or you're doing, you know, scoring for this or, or whatever. But in music also, especially, of course, even quicker turnarounds, yeah. you do a track, a song, even an album, that's going to end. And so everyone, just by putting yourself out there and just saying what you're looking for, what you want, I mean, that is, but for me at least, I've been here 14 years, has been um, the best way to just find the right people, find opportunities and put yourself in that position because everyone is always looking for something or always needing something yeah. and it's just it's like it on a, in a uh, a cold way you could say it's very trans transactional la can feel yeah. very transactional you can kind of there there's a bit of humanity that's lost in these types of relationships and these types of interactions i should say um but at the same time you know that's how the business works but you can also develop those deeper relationships. It just takes a bit uh, more effort to versus another profession where it's a full-time job in an office for years on end, right. you're developing these deeper relationships. You kind of have to go out of your way to develop those yeah. relationships. And so, so, yeah, that that's that's great. I want to know how you met Rick Rubin. You said yeah. you're a longtime collaborator with him and you said you were in that room because of him. Uh, how did that happen? Well, that's another uh, wild story. Um, that the initial the connection was one of those uh, John Hanlon, who, um, like I had mentioned earlier, is one of the folks who, uh, as a you know young twenty two or three year old or something, I, I went out to uh, his place in Malibu to install a Pro Tools system. You know, when I was working for um, Working, for, well, I guess for my business, but freelancing for Westlake sales. John division. Hanlin, the uh, producer, producer, engineer, mixing engineer, yeah. Neil Young, uh, Stephen Stills, yeah. Beach Boys, REM, yeah, uh, T Bone Burnett, right? And okay. so, in the same vein as what we're talking about, of making you know, making things known, um, what you want, what you want to do, um, yeah, I had been going out to him, I set him up, uh, on you know, he, him paying. Westlake, I think, as part of like an extended, you know, sales bundle, you know, or something like that. You know, he bought, yeah. this is a guy who I love John. Um, he is, he, you know, lives and breathes tape. And um, so mm. he was, you know, one of these folks in the early 2000s who was uh, interested in Pro Tools and digital audio um, and kind of dipped a toe in and uh, excited as we all were and are that like, wow, we can, without a tape machine, you know, I can set up a little thing on my dining room table and and make a recording. And um, yeah. so I initially set him up 
and then he had me out uh, another time to do some more training. And and by this point, we've hit it off, and and I'm fascinated by his career. And like, my goodness, what, I want to. How do you do this? And and he was very giving with, uh, you know, some techniques for mic mic techniques and stuff that I was interested in, and and just had these amazing mm-hmm. experiences. And um, and at one point, he, he suggested he's like, you know, can we? how about we like, can I keep booking time with you or giving you a call um, here and there when I get stuck on something? And maybe can we do sort of like a little barter? You know, I'll, I'll teach you the the old school stuff if you'll teach me the new school stuff, you know? And I was like, sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we went on like that off, you know, sporadically for years. Uh, and true cool. to his word, you know, he, I remember he would send me like, um, I remember one time, you know, he would tell me about, uh, he taught me the, like Glenn John's drum miking technique initially. And he, he taught me wow. different, uh, acoustic guitar miking techniques that I still use. Um, and he would send wow. me, uh, like printouts of the attack and release times of a Fairchild, you know, a Fairchild com- is a super fancy compressor, very coveted oh. compressor. And it, it works instead of attack and release. There's like these time constants and they're just fixed huh. numbers. One, two, three, four, you know, and, uh, and that stuff blew my mind. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is some secret knowledge about the most expensive, yeah. uh, you know, compressor in the world, whatever. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I would reciprocate, I'd get lots of super frustrated calls, you know, and he'd be like, you know, Pro Tools is the stupidest thing in the world. Like, how can I do it? Right. I'd be like, it's okay. It's okay. Here, let, let me help you out. Uh, yeah. And then he would always call, you know, 20 minutes later and be like, this, it's amazing. Oh my gosh. And so right. um, the, the way Rick gets involved in this is years later, um, he, um, John was working on a project for Rick, um, recording a live, um, Jayhawks album. And, um, I knew about this cause we talked at one point when he was on the road and I was like, Oh, that's so cool. You know, like, and you're working with Rick Rubin, how neat, you know, I'd love to come help you out. And I was always, again, like the mystery man, uh, instructed me, <laughs> uh, on the film yeah. lot, you know, gotta say what you man, want. I, if, I would, can I please come like be an actual like assistant for you at some point, you know? Yeah. Oh, we will. Mm-hmm. You know, he would say, we'll do that. You know, but, but this one, uh, you know, it's with Rick and it's, it's at Rick's, uh, I'm going to be home in a week and, and I'm going to be mixing at Rick's home studio. And it's not something I can like, you know, invite you over to or get you involved in. Ah, oh, that's all right, man. Keep me in mind. Um, and then a few weeks later, um, uh, you know, I was doing a, a gig at my studio in Atwater. And I remember it was kind of like a downtrodden day. I was really getting grinded, you know, by, by some, uh, artist I was working with and I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. another take. Sure, man. You know, and, uh, and John called and because I was in a session, I didn't pick it up. And I listened to the voicemail and he was like, uh, Dana, I'm back. Um, I'm working at Rick's and you know, Rick's, uh, engine, you know, assistant and pro tools operator had to leave, um, for a family, like a family emergency or something. And I I thought I could do this on my own and I just can't. And like, would you please find it in your heart to come up here for a few days and and help me out? And I'm I'm sure it's not what you're used to getting paid. Like it was this very, um, you know, hopeful (laughs) message. And the whole time I'm just like, you know, like, right, right. Ah. Um, how much do I pay you? Like, how does this work? Right, you know? right. And I was so <laughs> excited right. and it was freaking magical. You know, I'll never forget. Yeah. First time. Was this at Shangri-La? No, this was long before, um, Shangri-La. Okay. This is, uh, at a, a the Houdini house you were saying? It's or? near there. It was, uh, Rick had a place okay. It's really gorgeous. Um, you know, pl- uh, place above the sunset strip. And, okay. uh, you know, kind of La Cienega area, um, up the hill and gotcha. just incredible view and this beautiful, uh, Neve, uh, 8068, um, console. And it, it's like, it's where he lived, but the studio was down below with this lookout over the, mm-hmm. just, man, just awesome. <clears throat> and, uh, so cool. and so there was John and, um, so much analog gear going on console, uh, tape machines and so there there was no automation and uh so i was doing pro tools 
playback and and minor edits while he was mixing to like a quarter inch or half inch Studer. And, um, wow. and you know, one of the best parts was he was like, you know, all right, I can't reach all these things. And there's a harmonica solo coming up on this song. You know, I'm going to be riding the vocals and guitar. <laughs> like you grab the harmonica fader down there or whatever. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. You yeah. Know? Um, <laughs> nice. So anyway, um, that session went awesome. And I, I met Rick and I met um, his uh, production coordinator, this wonderful woman, Lindsay, at the time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and Lindsay wanted to keep me busy with some, like, you know, tape cataloging. You know, in, in that studio, there were these two inch reels of the most legendary albums. Like, it, you just see them like on a, on a bookshelf or something. And mm-hmm. mind blowing. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. albums that i you know grew up with i can stuff. imagine and, yeah right um, i can only imagine what what yeah you, you yeah seen there. and so at the time you know she had um this is a long story but it's an interesting one and it's, it's almost to the end and it's worth telling where um she said you know dana oh, I'm, um I'm into it. do you would you be around to like come back and maybe catalog some some of these tapes we have these you know uh, tapes that need i'm like hey anything i'm i'm so down okay well yeah, I'm really busy right now. Things are nuts, but give me a call in a few weeks, you know? And so I called in a few weeks. Oh yeah, Dana, right. I, I'm too busy. I can't think about that right now. Haven't forgotten about you. Give me a call back in two weeks, you know? And mm-hmm, I probably mm-hmm. did that like, you know, four times or so. And it was always the same response. And, um, mm-hmm. and so I just kind of was like, <sighs> damn, this is, I don't think this is a, this is a dead end. You know, I don't want to keep bothering mm-hmm, this, mm-hmm. this, uh, poor woman. <laughs> sure. Um, and I happened to talk to, um, a friend from Loyola who had moved to LA for, for a while as well. And mm-hmm. I remember uh, along the, around the same time, like he was, I remember before I met Rick and Lindsay, he had been doing some work, uh, with Rick at that house with Lindsay. And so, and when we caught up for a moment, we had, um, his name was Dave and we hadn't talked in a while and I was explaining, you know, he said, Hey, weren't you going to do some stuff? I said, yeah, but, um, I'm kind of getting this run around. It seemed like a really amazing opportunity, but every time I call and Lindsay, you know, mentioned that, and he was like, dude, no, she's not messing with you. Like she is so mm-hmm. busy. That's not her blowing you off. You you gotta call back and 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 keep keep yourself fresh in mind. You know, I was like, all right, uh, and I did. And it had been months at this point, and it took a moment for her to remember. You know who I was, and and oh yeah, Dana, right, 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 right. You were assisting uh, John Hanlon. You know. And I was like, yeah, you you had mentioned cataloging these tapes. And she's like, yeah, 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 forget about all that. Um, Do you do second engineering (laughs) as well? And I was like, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And I think John was the only person I had second engineered for at that point. Um, But of course, Uh yeah, yeah. (laughs) Always say yes. Always say yes. Yes to everything. You'll figure it out later. Right. (laughs) So she said, okay, well, I'm going to add you to my list of second engineers and um, keep Mm -hmm. you in mind. And I was like, okay wow, great. So thank you to Dave again for like giving that extra push. Like you got to call her back. And she probably, I think she called like a day or two later and was like, Hmm. um, are you available to second engineer for Greg Fiddleman? We're starting a new, um, Neil Diamond project at Neil's studio and Rick's producing. And I was just like, what is happening? Like, (laughs) yes, (laughs) I will be there. And, uh, that was and the, that was Home Before Dark? No, that was 12 songs. Um, oh, okay. And the album before that, and, which was incredible. Yeah. And um, ever, like, ever since then, it was just a, for, I don't know, 15 years or so, it was just nonstop, nonstop amazing stuff. I mean, you have great energy, and Rick is always, he is like, a, he is, he is, the he's all about the energy mm-hmm. uh, from what i gather mm-hmm. i've never worked yeah. with him but i i'm i'm a fan and admire yeah. and uh, you know i'm reading his book right mm-hmm. now um but it's it's so much about the vibe and the energy and i'm sure yeah. that like you know had 
you've been in that room that day and it, you weren't giving off the the energy that gelled with what he was orchestrating and creating in the yeah. room you wouldn't have gotten another call it's very true um yeah it's again the preparation meets opportunity mm -hmm. uh that you kind of knew how to handle yourself in a room like that um but also I mean, just kind of uh, who you are and how you carry yourself. I mean, I think that's, you know, a big testament to to that as well. Yeah. You know, to your point, uh, I remember when I was starting out and I I mentioned to Lindsay again, you know, Rick's at the time, Rick's production coordinator who really, you know, schedules and, um, you know, plans and studio uh, dates and held, really like held mm -hmm. all this stuff together and... Um, and there was a, an amazing crew of non-engineers who worked at Rick's house um, mm -hmm. as part of the, you know, Lindsay's staff or Rick's staff or, and they were all so awesome, like really magnificent people mm -hmm. I'm still friends with uh, to this day. And I remember telling Lindsay, you know, maybe the first week or two that I was really kicking around there a lot. Man, Lindsay, mm -hmm. I said, everybody here is just so nice and so cool I, it's just amazing and she said like very matter of factly she said yeah they wouldn't be here if they weren't you know <laughs> mm -hmm. and i was like mm -hmm. ah of course like you can right you know of course you have the coolest people like why wouldn't you <laughs> yeah and, yeah yeah of course you know and it's like mm -hmm. you're you're right i mean it is very much especially in the studio not to mention um outside of the studio and personal um, space of the house or whatever. Rick is very, very sure. in tune to um, the energy and the vibe and um, making making a space for the artist to feel free and open and creative and um, unencumbered. And, um, you know, nothing encumbers a, a, an artist and a vibe in the studio than somebody who's like, oh, I'm talking too much or I'm a real loud talker and I like, I chew with my right. mouth open and I'm <laughs> oh, like, gosh. I smell and I'm a pain in the butt, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, there's totally. some basic uh, essentials that, that go a long way. Yeah, so, um, you know, this is the New Music Business Podcast and I would be remiss to not talk to you about the business yeah. of all of this, yeah, yeah. Uh, of everything behind it. Uh, my first question, uh, though, is if you could help us understand all these various roles in a major studio recording project, like you mentioned Second Engineer. Mm -hmm. For someone who only does independent recordings, you know, shoestring budgets, all of that, what is a second engineer? And just kind of lay out all the roles, yeah. uh, you know, because I, I looked at your credits and man, I don't even know. Some things you're just listening to studio personnel and I don't even know what that means. <laughs> what, you're that's just a, hanging around for the vibes? No. <laughs> that's, a, that's a vague right. one that um, you probably will see that on like... Um, you know, title or something, or um, title. Yeah. <clears throat> if they don't have a, um, usually this the studio personnel I find on title or you know other credits places is kind of you're there mm -hmm. in addition to your other credit. Like if you find one where it says oh, okay. I'm studio personnel, I probably also have a a named credit elsewhere. But they seem to have sure. this duplicate studio personnel credit that that. You, you'll show well, lay out some yeah. of what uh these credits that you've had or or some of the ones in the studio and yeah. just what they do let's start because you mentioned it what is a second engineer well a second engineer is these days you don't hear it too often um it, okay. it and it's a little vague and i think for all intents and purposes it's kind of like an assistant engineer the, another word that okay. you'll hear is a uh, house engineer um okay. which is an engineer that um, is on staff at a studio um, and can okay. assist your sessions uh, if you're not bringing your okay. own assistant or something like that. Um, a second engineer um, might be a, a nicer, well, a perfect example would be like uh, me helping out on a fader move or something like that, you know, where, okay, okay, you know, where there's a main engineer, it's, it's that person's. Mm -hmm you know, project, but there are times when you need 
someone additional. And that's another name you might hear, like additional engineer. And right, yeah, all of those in practical purposes kind of are the same are different names for sort of the same thing. It's it's like a an okay. engineer, someone who's involved in the engineering side of a project who isn't the lead engineer, you know. And you might see multiple lead engineers on a project and that would mean that you know, uh this person was a lead engineer for a while and then this person became it or this person did all of the band tracking and then this person ended up doing the vocal tracking or something maybe the maybe the mm-hmm. artist engineer did did some stuff so it's not uncommon to have even though i'm saying the words like main engineer there's there are oftentimes multiple um main engineers but as a sort of way to separate uh kind of experience and ranking and credit and you know hierarchy um rather mm-hmm. than putting everybody in the studio on that line there is kind of a a sort of um, uh, ladder, um, and it's very confusing, man. I mean, that ladder, whether you're um, assistant uh, or second or additional or whatever that word is going to be, or if you're an editor, sure. if you're a, a mixer, um, you know, my experience, like, you know, I mentioned that um, Neil Diamond 12 Songs, that was the first album I, I worked on uh, with Rick. And that was Greg Fiddleman Engineering, who I adore. Greg and I have done tons and tons of albums together, and I've learned so much from from him. Um, mm-hmm. And um, there was a... I ended up doing... My first like big m- mixing job was like on that same album. There's an artist cut. Um, Greg mixed that full album. Um, okay. But speaking of, speaking of, you know music business that album was released like the year that you remember those like anti-piracy stickers and that on cds that that came around Mm -hmm. anyway there was a there was a new campaign to stop piracy and it it uh there was a real backlash i think it was a sony thing that screwed up a handful of releases when this first was rolled out like you couldn't play it in computers or um oh that's right remember i this? remember that and so they wouldn't even play in some like cars yeah. stereos yeah. or computers yeah um, right, exactly uh-huh. anyway it was around that time right. and um we did a a second version of the album that was like stripped down you know kind of like a let it be uh naked or something you know with just the original mm-hmm, components, mm-hmm. no overdubs. Um, and that was an amazing break for me. I was doing rough mixes, uh, f- uh, editing and rough mixes to present to Rick, and he loved the roughs. That, and I knew this was going to be my first time like playing my... Like, A mix mi- Yeah, Rick. yeah. And so, of course, yeah. I like, really worked on that stuff. And um, it was so cool. You know, he he called Neil and was like, I think we found our guy. And, and I was just... Wow. And, you know, so I was very early on in my um, career, especially with Rick at that point. And the point of that story is not just that it's, it was a really amazing moment and project for me. Um, but that after that, you know, I moved around a lot, you know, now I'm back to being an assistant again, and, and now I'm editing again. Mm-hmm. And when am I going to get to mix again? You know? Um, and, yeah. you know, like you said about LA and how it's gig to gig man, it's, you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it is like that. It's all short term and you can be Mm -hmm. flying high one minute and then not the next, you know, or, um, well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the business. So, so there's all these different roles. I mean, when you get offered a job, uh, for whatever position it may be, whether it's a, that assistant engineer, an editor, mixing engineer, um, lay out like give me some figures tell me how this works who like what are you like what could someone expect uh is someone who like doesn't know the business at all is not in la but wants to break in as an engineer as you know maybe starting as an assistant something just wants to start working on records like this um just help me understand what the business model looks like what do assistant engineers make what do mixing engineers make? What do uh, 
engineer lead engineers make what do, you know like t- talk to, I, I think we there's a lot of understanding like producers and stuff like that but not enough is discussed around engineers i honestly i have no concept yeah. or even a ballpark <laughs> of what engineers at this level make i know what i pay my mix yeah. in engineers and engineers but that's like a shoestring indie yeah. indie indie self-released whatever <clears throat> like t- on these like major major records when you're working with some of the biggest artists in the world some of the biggest producers in the world on major labels tell me about the business yeah it's um it's usually there's a couple different scenarios um the the regular mm-hmm. path is um which i didn't really do is you work through a studio um like let's okay. say you go to east west or something or um, sure and you um, say, you try to get a job. First, it's like you're a, an intern, and that's probably unpaid. Yeah. But you're, okay. you're running around, you know, emptying garbage and um, making coffee, maybe. Or <clears throat> sure. And you're also getting vetted, you know. <laughs> you're, you're like, yeah. those are hard gigs to get because you're around, mm-hmm. um, you know important people and, and certainly right. expensive equipment. And, um, so even though it's mm-hmm. not paid, it is still can be very competitive. Um, okay. and I hope I'm not doing a, a disservice to this hierarchy, which I, I didn't really do, but I'm very well aware of. Um, usually you come in as an intern, if you are well liked and, uh, do great work, um, the next thing you, you might be a runner. Uh, and, a runner is paid probably minimum wage um, to go get stuff, you know, um, office supplies, food orders, um, you know, errands, w- wash the artist's car, you know, whatever's needed. Um, you know, a big sure. studio will have a staff of people who can accommodate needs like that. Um, so people Got will it. spend a long time in, in a runner position hoping that one day, um, they can take the place of one of the house engineers or or would also be known as an assistant engineer oftentimes. Um, Mm -hmm. Runners are also, it's a great gig because while they're not typically allowed in a session, like in the the control Mm -hmm. room or live room, while the artist is there, they're very useful for teardown and setup and at the end of every night too, you know. So um, when the session is over, and the artist has has gone. Um, you know, I see this a lot when I'm. The artist is gone. Uh, the producer has left, and if I'm the engineer, I still have lots of work to do. I'm going to be making rough mixes. I'm going to be comping things. And but as soon as the artist and and producer leave, um, the doors open. Runners come in. The house engineer uh, is explaining what needs to get done. Um, Maybe there's a changeover. We're switching from, you know, rhythm section to overdub. So there's going to be a lot of moving parts in the studio, um, recalling the console. So even when you're um, a runner, um, mm-hmm. you you do get to hang out in the studio and be helpful and start learning the ropes. And then you try to get one of the jobs as uh, a house engineer. Um, and that'll mean, you know. What does that pay? Uh, I have, I don't know, honestly. Um, well, 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 you were you were an assistant engineer, a second engineer. What does that pay? Um, I mean, back when I was the engineering stuff. Um, now I don't know about a house engineer. That's probably a like sure. more salaried thing, you know. More salary, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. All of my work has been freelance, and in the engineering sure. world, it's usually billed um, as a day rate. Um, certainly, okay. as you get more established, that's pretty much the norm. Is uh, um, a day rate or it could be hourly. Um, I think, and what's a ballpark of a day rate, uh, for a second engineer um, for these big records? Let's see. Like my, my guy, uh, I've been paying, he's like 50 an hour. Um, it, like if I hire an assistant for stuff okay. or an engineer, um, you know, I'm not like I'm on a shoestring as well. You know, on on no, projects. no. I mean for the major label records, uh, not not for you know the ones that you're going out of pocket or something. Yeah, for an indie but it's record. still um, um, you know. for an assistant. I don't I don't remember. I remember like as an editor on big projects, mm-hmm. 
uh, back then. I think I was billing like 800 a day or something like that um, to okay. sit in a room uh, and comp vocals and comp band stuff. And, uh, you know, I was going to say, what does an editor do? Because, uh, again, uh, as someone who's only worked uh, with usually one or two people in a studio at a time uh, on the technical staff where it's like, you know, the producer and the engineer, which is like very, very typical for kind of what I've done. Um, it's like the engineer is doing everything. Yeah. They're the first, second, third, yeah. fourth engineer. They're the editor. They're doing Pro Tools. They, you know, yeah. uh, whatever. But so so what does an editor do if you're just an editor? It's kind of a, a thing that I, I ended up doing a lot of um, for mm -hmm. more um, experienced engineers. Uh, at, the, at the time, these would be like... Um, Greg Fiddleman and Andrew Sheps and Dave Schiffman and, you know, like doing my buddy Ryan Hewitt, you know, where mm -hmm. these are projects that are massive and, and high profile and moving fast, like faster than the mm -hmm. editing work can, can keep up the comping, the, um, tuning, the aligning, the, <clears throat> um, all yeah. that stuff. Um, and so it's kind of a, this great little, at least for me, I found for many years, a, a great little in between, uh, being an assistant or, you know, a second engineer mm -hmm. and being the lead engineer. Um, I would oftentimes come either come in once the pile of editing work was so great that more hands on deck were needed, or I'd be along, yep. um, another, another thing that I would do a lot is, um, be pro tools operator. And that's another, that's another, like, um, what does that job. mean? Isn't everything run through Pro Tools these days? Mm, most projects, yeah. Um, there are some okay. that are, you know, when I work, well, even when I do the Neil Young stuff with with John uh, Hanlon, that's still tape, but we're also yeah, running right. everything into Pro Tools, 192K. And, and, and just so I understand, is, is Pro Tools a catch-all term or you literally mean the Avid program Pro Tools and you don't work in logic or ableton or any of these other daws uh fl studio or anything out there that are professional daws out there is, it's are, yeah, it's literal um in the same sense it's literal yeah okay. um in the same sense that like the older term tape op would be um somebody mm -hmm. who knows tape machines inside and out and can throw reels on and off that thing super fast and can calibrate them, keep them clean. It's a similar job, um, being a pro okay. tools op, um, where have you worked in other DAWs? Me? Uh, not in, yeah. not like on a big record like that. I use, um, okay. I love Ableton as well. Um, I do stuff in machine, which is kind of has its, its own DAW. Um, sure. I feel like, you know, my take on, on the other softwares is mm -hmm. when you're a songwriter or producer, the, the sky's the limit. Like you can, you can use any of these platforms because you're, you're your own kind of creative being. You're like the one-stop shop. You, right. you're, it's your canvas to um, whatever you feel comfortable in. Um, but yep. in the world of recording studios and being of service to other people and their music pro tools is pretty right. still the 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 standard um if you want to be a, a freelance engineer or um mixer okay. or something like that um yeah so you know and that's not a, a diss on any of the other wonderful powerful you know daws that are out there um it just seems to be what most where where sessions end up. So if you have a, like a a songwriter or producer who works in Logic, tons of people work in Logic or, mm -hmm. or Ableton or whatever. Sure. When it comes time to um, overdub a bunch of vocals uh, with somebody else at a major studio, uh, let's say you made this awesome track, and um, you know now. Uh, you know, now we're going to the studio because uh, Rihanna's going to go on it or something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Chances are all of those those logic 
tracks are going to get brought into Pro Tools and, you know, her vocal producer is going to probably, I'm making assumptions here, but this is kind of what I, sure. what I mean is that things will end up as it turns from a track making creative process to more of a technical recording process and mixing process. Uh, things kind of make their way into Pro Tools. Um, yeah. That makes sense. And and I would imagine that probably happened on the scissor record. Um it, just because, you know, a lot of and what I found fascinating about that that album is it's such a a, a it's such a um dynamic record in the sense it's so diverse in terms of the production style. Uh you have stuff that sounds like, you know, a more traditional R and B uh you know sound that was create production that was created in the box like a beat mm -hmm. like what what you would we would call a beat yeah. you know the uh colloquial term of beat which really just you know the instrumental production that was you know probably created in logic or ableton or something like that i i don't know um and then there are some tracks uh like the one that um one of the ones that you mixed uh f2f that was more of like a full band sound, yeah. but then there's a combination of both. Yeah. And so I, I would imagine that it, it went through that similar process. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of stuff, um, you know, I, um, I'm pretty sure that most of that stuff was done in Pro Tools. Um, there were Pro Tools sessions mm -hmm. that were sent to me and um, I got that gig through my friend, Rob Beisel, who's amazing. and was mm -hmm. a one-time uh, assistant of mine, a very talented dude. Wow, We've worked cool. on tons of albums together. And um, and uh, he, you know, he moved to LA and we had a meeting out on my back patio. And he, you know, just has had this incredible trajectory and I'm so proud of him. And um, so I know he's a Pro Tools guy. He was the producer on, on Kill Bill. Yeah. <clears throat> on the album and uh a few others who co-produced uh blind yeah um and um right okay very cool yeah so i mean i, I bring Call that up girl. um both as a as a cool uh rags to riches story <laughs> not that he was from mm -hmm, rags mm -hmm. you know but uh but also as sure. like i you know i happen to know um I, well he does he uses ableton as well but um, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. You know, there were lots of different producers on there and that is very common to a lot of DAWs are in the creative process and then Pro Tools for the technical Right, yeah, I, I just, I, I haven't heard of too many producers that use Pro Tools for beat making mm. creation for like, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I just maybe just don't know. I'm not really in the technical world as well yeah. or in the production world as much. Uh, it just seems that more in the hip hop, R&B, pop realm, uh, make their beats somewhere else. And then when it comes to actually uh, tracking uh, organic instruments or vocals or something, that's when you kind of transfer on over mm -hmm. to Pro Tools yeah. or something. But um, so so tell me more. I want to get back to kind of the business side of all of this. Um, and uh, tell me more about, so, so we're saying like an editor is like maybe 800 a day or something like that. What are some of these other technical roles in a studio and and how the how that works um and i mean even like well let's let's do mixing engineer because that's a uh that's a very visible um and very important uh arguably one of the most important technical aspects of a record um how is that working what are the ballpark ranges that a mixing engineer can expect on some of these big major label records yeah that too is like uh, all over the map and uh very um, you know, none of this stuff is unionized. There's no uh, set rates. It's definitely a very freelance and supply and demand and name recognition type sure. of thing. <clears throat> um, and honestly, um, you know, a lot of my stuff um, for the major stuff is like, it goes all over the place, but oftentimes it'll be like 3500 bucks or something like that. For, per song and that'll include per song. revisions wow. and stems and you know the whole the whole nine yards um because that is and, and it can be the gamut i mean i've done mixes for mm -hmm. 500 dollars, and i've done mixes sure. you know 
for for more. And I certainly know other high profile mixers that you know get many, many, many thousands more. You know, if you really have like a some sort of superstar mixer name, um, and you also mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I, I don't have points on everything I do, but a, a lot of stuff, you know, so there's another, um, you know, there's a, a way once you have done enough or uh, maybe you're involved enough in a project uh, where you can, that, and the artist uh, agrees that you can participate in some, you know, um, net receipts uh, royalties if, if the album were to recoup. The, the mixing engineer can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what are we looking at? What are we talking about in terms of for points? mixers? You know, for mixers, it's typical like a one point type of thing. Um, and you said net receipts. Can you just explain what that means on a record, yeah. you know, like on a major label record? And does that come from the artist share or how does that all work? Yeah. So just okay. like producer points, um, <clears throat> uh, any usually the record contract stipulates, uh, you know, that any third party royalty people is going to come out of the artist's share. And um, Mm -hmm. that's how producers get points. Uh, Those come out of, you know, so if you look at the, you know, traditional, let's say 85, 15 split from where a major Mm -hmm. label is taking 85% of the the Mm -hmm. master, um, or paying out a fifth, they're taking all the master and paying the, the artist a 15, percent royalty um the Mm -hmm. net receipts part works for the artist as well where if the label has you know spent x amount of dollars to make the recording paying uh studio time and uh, all all associated recording costs um they're going to make all of that back before anyone uh, gets a royalty um the artist included so that's the net part um the receipts i think just mm-hmm. kind of alluding to the receipts of uh, the cost to make the thing. Um, mm-hmm. So once the album has been recouped, which is, that's a whole other discussion because, um, you know, the more you spend on an album, the harder it can be to recoup. Um, sure. Most albums don't recoup. <laughs> right. Um, but it's still, an, I think, an important uh, formality and precedent um, something that I always will uh, ask for, um, knowing that the majority, it's not going to mean anything uh, financially, but it's sort of a Mm -hmm. representation of the creative part that, um, that I can bring to the project, the, the personal creative IP, if you will, uh, apart from the song and all that, that, that is imbued in the master by way of creative decisions mm-hmm. from the mixer's perspective. Um, and so, yeah, those points, yeah. let's say the artist has a deal with the producer and they're giving the producer three points and a mixer one point or mm-hmm. five and one or mm-hmm. superstar mixer getting three, you know, two, well, like whatever it is, sure. that's going to be from their slice of 15. And so right. um, that's something that is, takes a while to get your head around too, is like um, one point doesn't mean 1% of the master share, it means uh, one fifteenth of the artist share, um, or whatever the artist right. share is. Uh, and it's tricky; it's hard to stipulate a bit in contractual terms because you don't always know what the artist deal is, and so you have to use mm. you know special language that's like you know will be paid in the same accordance as other contributors and artists. So it's like it's this real nebulous. Uh, scale and oftentimes I don't know what um, percentage that one point is until I see it in Sound Exchange, you know, and I'll see, oh, there's an huh. okay, so I'm getting, you know, five uh, percent or something like that. Um, okay, so that means that mm-hmm. if one point's five percent, then I can kind of figure out what the artist's deal was or something like that. Um, right. Cause you would do like one divided by, I'm like crunching it right now. One divided by 18. That's you're looking at around 5.5% yeah. yeah. or something like that. So you're like, Oh, okay. The artist is probably getting 18 right. uh, percent on, you know, in their deal exactly. or like what's one divided by 17 is like, that's yeah, it. And know, so, so exactly a right. lot, what I end up doing, um, 
And, and you know, of course, I have lawyer, lawyer and boilerplate stuff um, but for the, that I've created with them for my own um, agreements. I like to just talk in the percentage. And I think I've talked uh, on uh, Ari's Take Academy uh, in comments about that as well, where it's it's mm-hmm. much easier to, you know, the points lingo is very old school. And um, right. the recording agreements these days are all over the map and in, in a great mm-hmm. way. Um, and so many artists own their masters and, and release things entirely. So rather sure. than using the older lingo, uh, you know, yep. for points based on a, you know, 15 point artist deal or 18 or 20 or whatever, it's just easier to mm-hmm. say, you know, um, I'd like 5% of the artist share, you know, and if you own a hundred percent of that mm-hmm. master, that's 5% of a hundred. And, you know, if you, um, mm-hmm. if you have, 15 percent it's you know five percent of that 15 so it's scalable and people un- t- tend to understand yeah. it more as well um it's a little easier yeah to and that to. In, in producer deals that's very uh similar to they say you know typically you're getting between 15 to 25 percent of the artist share yeah. and uh for indie records you know producers that i've seen and worked with that you know they'll the, that it'll be around that yeah. range and and when you're crunching those numbers like of like okay points. typically a producer's getting three yeah. points you know divided by 15 that's 20 percent right. right there so exactly so that that makes a lot of sense um well uh dana i we we have uh the time has flown by and i could keep talking to you for the next four Likewise, hours and, and I, I i wish we could <laughs> i i know it's it's been a, a treat to understand the side you know i i think you're the first I, not I think I know you're the first mixing engineer or engineer period that we've had mm. on the show and uh, and so it's it's nice that yeah <laughs> and I have to say um, like you know I am a huge fan of yours and a huge fan you. of your academy I'm I've you know bought almost all the courses and I love them I love yeah. the people I love the Thank community you. like I love your book like I, I recommend it to everybody so um, I just want to give you, you enormous props for what you do and bring to this community and just dispelling all of this stuff and making it easier for everyone to understand. And uh, it's a real treat to turn the, I, I really came to, if I can do one last little tiny thing, came to your, to ATA by way of just, wh- because I've been so fortunate to work in these, you know, major label iconic artists world, when people ask me or used to ask me, you know, what, what happens now? Um, you know, the independent artists that I would work with on the side, you know, okay, thanks. This sounds amazing, Dana. Like, I love it. Like, what do I do next? You know, I'd just be like, I have, I haven't the slightest idea. Like that's not, (laughs) not my world. And I I really got interested in trying to figure that out. And, um, and, uh, it's been really empowering, uh, both for me and my own little, you know, dabbles with my own music but more importantly i feel like because of the the stuff that i've learned from you um and and your teachers in the academy is like i can really help the artists that i'm working with i was on an hour-long call last night with with an artist i'm producing like got the first single out the spotify is set up okay here's what we got to do like this is you know um and uh it i don't know i get i get fired up about too many things (laughs) Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I just, I don't know. I love it. It's really great to have such. Well, a cool... I, I really appreciate it. And you, uh, you have contributed so much to the academy, and I really appreciate everything that you've oh, brought. And and uh, you're just such a warm presence in there. And and thanks, we're man. so appreciative of everything you've brought. And it's just, it's this, it's this wonderful community that everyone is giving and taking yeah. and just sharing and and lifting everybody else up. And and uh, you really embody that, and I, yeah. uh, you know, we really appreciate that. Thanks, and the man. energy that you bring. I love it. Um, yeah, well, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I have one final yeah. question oh, that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Of course, you do. Uh, come on, you know this is coming oh, at I've you. Been, like, uh, what does it mean nights. to you? <laughs> Thinking of what your answer yeah, is. Yeah, I don't. What does it mean to you to make it in the new music business, uh, Dana? Man, oh man, <laughs> uh, this is surreal. Um, I. I, you know, I'm looking to my right because I wrote some some blabbery notes. I think, you know, please, it it's definitely 
<laughs> wearing a lot of hats. Um, and, um, I mean, I, I can't, I'd be remiss and it's hard not to think about like, you know, making it meaning, um, being able to sustain your, yourself, your family, your, your, your rent, you know, your dog food bill, whatever it may be, you know, uh, with, <laughs> yeah. with music. Um, and it doesn't have to be entirely that. Um, but, um, I, I mean, I think that's such a basic answer, but I think that is what it feels like to make it for, for me. Like, I feel like, uh, I have so many goals and so many more things that I, I want to do and, and things I want to learn and all that, but I'm very lucky to feel, I, I feel like I've made it, uh, in my own little way. Uh, my wife and I, like, all we do is freelance music jobs and we like get to live in LA awesome. and it's all we've ever, <laughs> ever done. Um, and so I, I feel very fortunate to uh, have had the experiences experiences that I've had, and I, I hope that it continues. But I'm also always aware that, you know, it may not. And I always you know, say, if I end up back in Chicago, you know, bagging groceries at the Jewel Asco, <laughs> I, I'll get, I've, I've, I've some great <laughs> stories to tell, you know, I've, I had a good run. That's right. <laughs> um, and so yeah. I, I kind of, I try to keep that um, perspective that it, it can be fleeting, uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to run with it while it's, uh, while it's here. And for me, it just means like wearing a lot of hats and following a lot of learning new stuff. And, um, you know, it's, I was thinking the other night, it's smart that your the title of your, your book about, you know, the, the new music business. Cause it's like, feels like it's new every few days, you know, new, new stuff mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. constantly happening. And I feel like the deeper you go, into it um the more <laughs> the more it changes <laughs> but it's it's amazing to, yeah. <laughs> to have uh, you and the community as a as a resource to to hit up and just be yeah. like well what which you know <laughs> anyway yeah yeah well dana nielsen thank you so much this thank has you been great. Ari. thank you you're you're a legend man i really i'm really honored to be here thank, thank you, you. Today's episode was edited by Ari Davids with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.